turn then to the big topic uh, for tonight. Uh, and we may not have enough time for tonight, but heaven knows it's a big enough topic. Um, the title was, As Capitalism's Crisis Deepens, Thoughts of Socialism uh, Return Again. So let's talk about socialism. In any American audience, to even say what I just said, let's talk about socialism, gets already scary vibrations surging through the room. So I need to address those first. I don't want to lose you in the next few minutes. We are a strange country in more ways than one. But one of the strangest things about us is the weird taboo we have lived under for the last half century, which, looking at most of you, takes in most, if not all, of your lives. What's that taboo? We can't talk about socialism. We can't talk about socialism and compare it to capitalism. We can't do it. It's too scary. Any halfway reasonable attempt to look at socialism as one thing and capitalism as another and look at the strengths and weaknesses of the one and compare them to the strengths and weaknesses of the other. That, no. That's out. We can have a debate about our education system. We can have a debate about our health system. We can have a debate about what marriage is. I think mean, these are pretty heavy topics. But we cannot have a discussion about socialism and capitalism. Instead of a discussion, we have what? A cheerleading afternoon for capitalism and a make pee pee on socialism. That's what, that, that's what we do. And I chose my words carefully because I want to suggest childishness. We can't. The legacy of the Cold War, even though the Soviet Union isn't there anymore, is still with us. You can't do it. It's been a taboo. To be interested in socialism meant, for most of those years, to be suspected of treason, of disloyalty, of evil without a name, of apostasy, of you name it, that's bad. That's what it is. I like to tell the story, I apologize for those of you who've heard it before, that when I first began teaching uh, as a young professor in this country, I was flabbergasted because I quickly understood that my students thought of socialist, communist, Marxist, anarchist, and terrorist as synonyms. And I made a mistake. I said, Jesus, these are uneducated people. It wasn't that. I mean, I don't want to say they were educated, but it wasn't that. What it was, was a reflection of American history. Back in the 1930s, it isn't exactly dinosaur era, back in the 1930s, socialists and communists were okay. There were lots of people who were in the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, and who told their friends and neighbors that they were socialists and communists because it was all right. You know, like it is in uh, most European countries. In fact, in my, part of my family's French, in my French family, there's communists and socialists and middle of the roaders and even people who read Le Figaro, which if you know European newspapers, is a pretty right-wing paper. But you know, when the family picnic gets together, the communists and the right-winger are eating the same foie gras sandwich. That's a joke, okay? It's very hard to demonize socialists and communists if your Aunt Mary is one. This is hard. And for Europeans, they therefore don't have this problem. But we managed to demonize them, to root them out in the 1940s after the war. And the government and the big business community was very clear that they had really taken it on the chin in the 1930s in the Great Depression with the New Deal, which taxed corporations and the rich to provide social security and unemployment benefit and minimum wages and government jobs and all of that. They didn't want that anymore. And they knew they had to get rid of the coalition that made that possible. The coalition of the Communist Party, two Socialist Parties, and the 
AFL-CIO, or actually the CIO, not so much the AFL. They weren't together then. So they went after that coalition, and they picked on the weakest link first, the Communist Party, and they destroyed them. They converted them from militant leftists into agents of a foreign power. And as soon as they got rid of the communists, they turned to the socialists. And they went to the American people and they said, socialists, you see, are just like the communists. They just spell it differently. Which is why Americans think communists and socialists are the same. And they all carry bombs in their left rear pockets. And they are hiding under your bed. And they mean you and your puppy lots of harm. So you really should watch out for them. You really should, and, and keep away. And so Americans have been good and docile. Cut off any, that's all badness. So it's very hard to talk about socialism. And it has been for a long time. On the other hand, capitalism, how do I say this politely, hasn't been doing too well for the last six, seven years. And it has no prospect of getting much better. I don't know if you saw the latest numbers of the economic growth of the United States in the last quarter. Well, I shouldn't call it growth because there wasn't any. And the numbers that came out today about Great Britain and Germany indicate they're not going anywhere either. So there's no, who's recovering? Nobody. Capitalism isn't doing so well. And then, and then what happens? People begin to say to themselves, even Americans, what else is there? Is there anything else? What could it be? And then dimly, there's a remembrance, oh yeah, there's this other thing, socialism. Scary, but there it is. But Americans are opening up, and they have been for five years. Otherwise, there's no way on earth that a man who has with, withheld nothing about his own self-definition as a socialist, Bernie Sanders could run for president. That's an amazing thing. In its peculiar way, that's a little bit like, I mean, I know there's many differences, having a black, an African-American, run for president. We were blown away eight years when that amazing thing happened. But to have a man who, who doesn't deny that socialist pretty much covers his own sense of who he is, is now running uh, for office. I should say not everyone uh, agrees that he's a socialist and not everyone even agrees that he's Bernie Sanders. <laughs> I, I, I assume you all heard the story. I, I can't resist. Uh, that Sarah Palin uh, was corrected between our last meeting and this one for making a speech that indicated that her handlers, uh, the, pe the people who advise her, I guess we shouldn't refer to them as handlers. Not that. Anyway, um, the people who advise her hadn't been careful. So she referred to the new entrant into the Democratic Party as Bernice Anders. <laughs> so I want you to understand, it's not Bernice Anders, it's Bernie Sanders. That may make a difference to some, but it's, who knows. Okay, the word socialism, first off, the word socialism has meant many, many different things. And that has been true for hundreds of years. But let's deal with it today. Bernie Sanders calls himself, and is called by many others, a socialist. Barack Obama is called by many people a socialist. No, I mean that. He's called a socialist. You all know that. It's, it's, it happens now. And it's been happening ever since he became an important uh, figure in American uh, politics. Hugo Chavez, the former head of Venezuela, referred to himself as a socialist. The current uh, French government, the president, Francois Hollande, 
the majority in the Senate and the majority in the National Assembly, all three branches of government are controlled by a majority of Socialist Party members who refer to themselves as Socialists. So Mr. Hollande, the Socialist, works out with Mrs. Merkel, the German Conservative, what the policy will be towards Greece. Speaking of which, the government that imposed austerity and was thrown out by the Greek people was the Greek Socialist Party, which was replaced by Syriza, which defeated the Socialists and is called by the New York Times a leftist party. But what was the Socialist Party? Socialists are very important in many European governments. Socialist parties exist in every European country and in many cases are the second party or even the first party. The Soviet Union is the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Hint! The People's Republic of China refers to itself as a socialist. Whoa! Castro's a socialist? This is confusing, isn't it? So what is socialism? There is no answer to that. People who speak about socialism in the singular haven't been paying attention. Socialisms there are, and they have been for a long time. So let's try to unpack where they come from and what, what the story was, where even the names come from. And bear with me, it's a little bit of history, but there's no other way that I can think of to do this in a sensible uh, manner. The system before capitalism in Europe was called feudalism lords and serfs and feudal manners and all of that. But it was a very organic society. Everybody knew their place. You were a serf, that meant your child was a serf. Everybody was born into a fixed place in a very well-ordered society. The people on top were the lords and the folks who kept the peace between the lords and the serfs were known as the church. And there was a church and there was the lords and it was all, everybody knew where he, she fit. It was a gendered organization, it was a class organization, it was a religious, and all inter everybody had a place. And when that system broke down, we don't have the time right now to deal with it, and an alternative system began to develop and eventually made a violent revolution to destroy feudalism and open the space for itself, that new system, which we now call capitalism, revolted against the old feudalism in two important ways. One, we don't want lords and serfs, none of that. None of those old rules, they trapped people in fixed identities, you couldn't break out, it was very unfair, etc., etc., etc. We are gonna break, and we're gonna break in the following way. Everybody isn't gonna have a place in society. Everybody's gonna start at the same point. Everybody's going to be free. Everybody's going to have liberty to develop himself, herself, and whatever. We're going to focus not on the whole, but on the individual. It's the celebration of individualism as the breakout of capitalism, the end of feudalism, the freedom of the individual to do whatever he or she wanted as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. Remember? You learned that when you were seven. You should have outgrown it when you were eight, but in any case, you learned it when you were seven. And I don't want to upset you about it. And the revolutions made promises. All revolutions do that. And the capitalist revolutions made the promise, well, let's pick the best of them, the French Revolution, 1789. Liberty, equality, fraternity that you get rid of feudalism, that's what the revolution was about, remember they cut off the heads of the queens and kings, which is a symbolic way of saying enough of that. And we have a new system, we're separating people from their heads, that's a sign we don't like what they represent. So we're gonna overthrow feudalism, bloody overthrow, and we're gonna establish capitalism, the system where any individual can do whatever he wants isn't a serf. Doesn't matter who you were born to. 
You're free. You're free of feudal obligations. You're free of that old, rigid, structured society. It's an individualist free-for-all. And if we have capitalism, we bring it in, it is the embodiment of freedom in economics, and it will usher in liberty, equality, and brotherhood, fraternity. 1789. By 1850, half a century later, not very long, capitalism is really settling in in Europe. Feudalism is dying, what's left of it. But the people in Europe are discovering something. They're discovering that capitalism has indeed replaced feudalism. But liberty, equality, and fraternity is nowhere in sight. Instead of the lord and the serf, we have the capitalist and the proletarian. And they're not getting more and more equal. They're getting, well, you know, like now further and further apart. And so there begins to be a criticism of capitalism. What happens to all economic systems? It develops critics. Slavery had critics, feudalism had critics, any system, every system we know of, eventually, and it didn't usually take very long, had its critics. Capitalism, having promised so much and having delivered much less, literally developed its own criticism. How could it not? So people began to turn against this capitalism, saying it didn't bring liberty, equality, and fraternity. Didn't bring it, didn't, didn't look like it was going to bring it. it. Was creating a whole new set of contradictions, conflicts, tensions, the things we thought we would overcome and get beyond when we made the revolutions against feudalism. It didn't work out. And what name did the critics come up with? Interesting. They went after capitalism on the very point that capitalism was so proud about. The individualism. This new system had everybody doing whatever they could get away with. It was celebrating that. Its leading economist, a Scottish gentleman who studied divinity. So he was a, a noble Scottish gentleman. Adam Smith, a professor of religion, came up with the following stunning idea. You can see how useful it was. If every person seeks to pursue their own self-interest, it'll all work out for the best for everybody. Jesus, that's nice. Doesn't that make you feel better? I just have to take care of number one, and it'll be the best for everybody. This is very comforting, but as a principle to organize society, oh my God, are you in danger? Because it might turn out that if people go after what's good for them and don't care about the larger implications and the social consequences, you could have a society that tears itself apart. And there were philosophers way back then who warned about it. Thomas Hobbes writes a book. He says, you know this business with everybody pursuing their own self-interest? That's going to make a society in which life is nasty, brutish, and short. That's what he wrote. He wasn't so pleased. He didn't think Adam Smith had this right. Not at all. So what did the critics of capitalism come up with? We're not for the individual first and foremost. We're for the community first and foremost. Not the old kind of society, the feudal, we over, we're not for that, but a new one. A society based on liberty, equality, and brotherhood. First, and the individual, second. And to call it something, they came up with a name, not individual, but social. Not individualist, socialist. 
You ever wonder why anti-capitalism isn't another ism that has to do with economics, like capital? Because it's not about the narrow economics. It's about a different vision of how you organize and understand what society is. Socialists were anti-capitalists because they wanted the society as a whole, its well-being, its survival, its growth, its interrelationships among people to be the determinant, the goal, the standard of what's successful as a society uh, and what is okay? And that, that, that kind of a thinking starts at the end of the 18th century, and it has precursors, but at the end of the 18th century, and gets really going in the 19th century as capitalism settles in. It predates Marx, for those of you that are interested in the Marxism part, which is coming in a few minutes. It predates Marx. Marx is not, didn't start socialism or anything like that. Socialists and communists, calling themselves that, existed before Marx was born. He learned about them as he grew up as a young student, but these are not movements or ideas he invented. Absolutely uh, not. But he becomes very important. He gets excited. He feels betrayed Marx now. He feels, and by the way, I concentrate on Marx not for any other reason than simply that has become the most important tradition of anti-capitalist thought and action ever since. Marx from 1818 to 1883, he dies in 1883. That means it's only about 130 years, roughly, since Marx's death. And in that 130 years, Marxism has spread to every country on this planet. There are Marxist journals and Marxist organizations and Marxist unions and Marxist political parties and Marxist professors and Marxist, you name it. Nothing else functions quite like that. Marxism has answered some extraordinarily wide interest in the world to have spread like that. Few movements in the history of the human race have a history of that kind of spread that fast. But by the way, if you spread that to that many different cultures, at that many different levels of, of, of cultural and historical and, and economic development in a short amount of time, of course you're going to have different concepts of socialism and capitalism and communism because all these different people are trying to get their heads around what that all means. And they're going to come up with different interpretations of Mr. Marx's writings. Therefore, of course, there are multiple socialisms and communisms. The idea that all of that would have come up with one basic idea that everybody agrees to, that's too silly for words. That couldn't happen. It never did happen. The idea that there's a single thing called Marxism or socialism or communism is a fantasy in the eyes of people who don't know very much about this. Okay. Then Marx does come along. And Marx is furious. He says, you know, as a young man, he says this, by the way, as a young man, I thought the French Revolution was the greatest thing there ever was. Liberty, equality, fraternity, that's, that's it. That's what I want. And I was okay with capitalism because capitalism was going to bring us that. But it didn't, he says. Not only that, he says, when I look at it, you know something? Capitalism isn't the vehicle to do it. Because capitalism replaces the serf and the lord with the proletarian and the capitalist. And that's the same impossible, hostile, contradictory arrangement. So I still love liberty, equality, fraternity. I still love the French Revolution. Marx is very clear about that. But I got to tell you, capitalism isn't the way to get it. Capitalism is the obstacle preventing. And therefore, we've got to get beyond capitalism if we're going to get liberty, equality, and fraternity. Isn't that a complex argument? And how are we going to do that? Marx writes and thinks with his friend, Freddie. Freddie Engels. Um, and they come up with an idea. Again, they were not the only ones, but they become so famous that we refer to them a lot. A little bit later, I'll tell you about the difference between the Marxism and the other kinds. But for the moment, Marx and Engels come up with an idea others do too. How are we going to change capitalism? Go beyond it. What is that going to mean? 
and they don't do very much with it because they don't know how to guess about the future and they don't believe in it. We're not prognosticators. We don't know what the future is going to bring. Don't ask us. Nobody does. That's what the word future means. We don't know. But here's what we have. We think that you'd be closer to liberty, equality, and fraternity if the people who made the decisions in every workplace were all the workers who work there. That, is it a guarantee that everything will go well then? No, no, no. But if you want liberty, equality, and fraternity, then stop having business organized so that a tiny group of people at the top, the owners and the top managers, have all the power and use their power to pick up most of the rewards of the business. That isn't all that surprising, is it? So if you want to go in the direction of more equitable distribution of the fruits of our labor, if you want people to have the time, the leisure, the interest, the knowledge to be in a society of liberty, equality, yep, equality, and brotherhood, then we kind of got to be all pretty much on a par. It's about as far as they went. And that means we can't leave the industry in the hands of the few who have it, who own it. And we can't leave it in the hands of the few who manage it. We can't. But they're not going to go quietly. They like being on top. They like being rich. They like making the decisions. And they don't like us. Not one bit. So this is going to be messy. And so most of the 19th century, these people split on the following question. How are we going to make the transition from capitalism to a egalitarian, libertarian, brotherhood-based system in which everybody is roughly equal? One side said, we're going to do that the same way capitalism came in the world. Capitalism came in, Marx's quote, dripping blood from every pore. Whether it's the civil wars in England in the 17th century, or the French Revolution in the 18th, or the American Revolution, blood violent revolution was how capitalism was brought into this world. So socialism was going to have to do that too. The revolutionary transformation. The other group said, Ooh, take it easy. Uh, the people in charge are not going to like to hear any of this. And they're strong, and we're not. And they have the army, and we don't. And they'll use it. We know that. So here's a better plan. We're going to form political parties and campaign for votes. We're going to what? We're going to become parliamentarians. We're going to run for office. But whether you're a revolutionary or, by the way, what they would call the other ones, the evolutionary socialists. Very important. Biggest debate was in Germany, where these positions were worked out by the great thinkers uh, of that time. Evolutionary socialism, the title of a book by a man named Edward Bernstein, who was the great theorist of, the, of this way of going. And he incurred the enormous hostility of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Kautsky and others, the great thinkers of that time, who were in favor of a revolutionary path. But whether you were evolutionary or revolutionary, and here comes an important thing, both of them thought that the way you make the transition is you capture the state, either by revolution you know, you overwhelm, you take over the palace, you take over the presidential building, you seize the White House. Or the evolutionary one, you win the election and you become the government. But the idea was you seize the state, and here we go now, and then you use the power of the state that you've captured, either by revolution or evolution, to make the transition. Please be aware, in that way of thinking, the state is the means to get to socialism. 
Capturing the state is not socialism itself. That would be a grotesque misunderstanding. You capture the state in order to then rearrange the society. Okay, so what happens? Towards the end of the 19th century, into the 20th century, that's what Marxists do. Country after country, they become more and more powerful and they try to seize the state. The most powerful in Germany, where Edward Bernstein's evolutionary strategy wins, in a sense, the, the German uh, Socialist Party, Sozialistische Partei Deutschland, SPD, says we are going to become the majority party, take the state and make the revolution then. And they become very, very powerful the last years of the 19th century and the years before World War I. In Russia, a different party has a different method. They, they do electoral stuff, but then in the chaos of World War I, when capitalism in Russia is destroyed because it loses World War I, Lenin, an exile in Switzerland at the time, looks at the situation in Russia and says, this is a paraphrase, says, we don't have to wait. We don't have to do this electoral stuff. They are so weak right now, we can take it. A tiny political party, the Bolsheviks, tiny. A huge country, overwhelmingly agrarian. Bolsheviks had six peasants in the entire party. They were intellectuals, they were urban people, and so forth, by and large, industrial workers, not peasants. And Russia was a peasant country. But we can do it. We can actually do it. Most other socialists of the time thought Lenin was nuts and told him so. But they already thought Lenin was weird because Lenin, in the face of World War I, had said to the Russian working class, this is a war between imperialists Workers have no business being involved in this. Don't fight. That's why he had to be in exile, because they were going to arrest him for telling the Russian people. By the way, the American socialist leader, Eugene Victor Debs, did exactly the same thing, and they put him in jail. Because he said to the American workers, you shouldn't be fighting him. It's not a war about you. You should not be killing the workers of other countries. What the hell are you doing? You're doing the dirty work of the capitalists. They want a war, let them fight it. You shouldn't fight it. So Lenin was already strange, and now you look at even stranger. But he pulled it off. He did it. He captured the state in a revolutionary way. And all of the people who had tried to do otherwise, didn't. When the dust of World War I cleared, one socialist had captured state power. Nobody else had. And the one who had, had used violent revolution to do it. Amazing. I gave the Soviet Union an incredible position in the world of socialists. They're the ones who had done it. They're the ones who had done it. And immediately at the end of World War I, all socialists around the world split. They split on the following basic question. If the Russians did it, and they did it in that way, that's the way to go. And the other socialists said, are you crazy? That's peculiar, that's the special conditions of Russia. That was this and this. No, 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 don't draw that in inference. They couldn't come to an agreement. So the people who thought that Russia showed the way withdrew from the socialist parties, withdrew from the socialist movement, and to underscore their view, they said, we're gonna take a new name. We're gonna call ourselves communists. That's where this comes from. That's where it begins. All communist parties start in 1921, 1920. They all begin in that split. The American party, the Soviet party, all of them. And it's a fight about what? 
How to make the transition from capitalism to socialism? No. How to capture the state? What should be your political path? Evolutionary with politics or revolutionary? That was the issue. Now fast forward. For 10, 15 years, 1917 to 1930, the Soviet Union, this new society, the only socialist society on the earth at that time, recovers from World War I, and to the surprise of everybody, starting with Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, and all the rest, to the surprise of all of them, they survived. Remember, they had lost World War I, then there was a revolution, then there was a foreign invasion, again, I love to remind my American audiences. In 1918, four nations invaded the Soviet Union to destroy the new Soviet revolutionary government. Britain, France, Japan, and the United States. 10,000 American troops landed in Russia to overthrow their government. No Russian troops ever landed in the United States to overthrow anything. Americans have been worried blue that it might happen and can't understand why the Russians could even imagine such a thing. History, uh, unfortunately, doesn't work that way. So they were a destroyed society. They had a civil war on top of it. They came back quickly at enormous sacrifice to the Soviet working class to rebuild that society after World War I. And they had done it by the end of the 1920s, at enormous sacrifice. But the problem was the government, and this is the most important thing that we'll have time for today, the government of the Soviet Union had replaced all the private industrial corporations. The private industrialists had mostly left Russia, became exiles, went to places like Paris, London, New York. Or they became workers like everybody else. But they lost their position. The private corporate leaders, gone. The shareholders, gone. One of the first things the Russian Revolution did, close the stock market. There's no need for a stock market to buy and sell, because that stock certificate you have, tear it into strips and save on toilet tissue. Because that's what it's worth gone. And the government came in and took over. The government appointed people to run the factories. In the aftermath of the revolution, the workers still went to work Monday to Friday. They did the same tasks they did before. But instead of doing it for a board of directors selected by the big shareholders, private capitalism, they did it for the government. What the government had done is seize the economy. But they hadn't transformed the economy, and they never did. Stalin declares in 1930-31, this is socialism. Lenin, dead by that time, would have, and probably did, turn over in his grave. No, he would have said, what we have, Lenin's phrase is state capitalism. The state has become the capitalist. And that's important, and that's good that we did that. That's what the revolution accomplished, and that was great. But now the task was to transform, and you, Stalin, you didn't transform, you just declared that, here we go now, when the state is in charge, we got socialism. Wow from being the means to the transition, seizing the state, seizing the state became the transition. From the means, it became the end. The end of the, we have socialism because the government has taken over. Even though the relationships between the government running the industry and the mass of people is not that different from the relationship of the private individuals who used to occupy those positions in relationship to the mass of the working people. But for the next, what? For the next century, to, here we are. We have a mass of people, most Americans, who think 
that socialism has something to do with the government being in charge. No, that's not the idea. The idea was to get the government because with that power, you could then make the transition. It wouldn't be the transition. It would be the step that would allow you to make the transition. And what would the transition be? Let's go back to reorganize enterprises, factories, offices, stores, so that they would work in the interest of the whole community because the whole community would be making the decisions. Not a small subset, the owners of the shares, the boards of directors, tiny minorities. No, 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 that's over. The question was, did the state transform the economy? And the answer is no, they didn't. Not because they're bad and not because they're stupid or nothing like that. This is the way the history worked out. It's an understandable thing. Poor Stalin. Well, he had to go to the Russian people who had sacrificed unspeakable in their lives. And what was he going to say to them? Thank you very much. You've sacrificed unbelievably now for the last 15 years. It's 1930 since the revolution. I'm glad to announce to you all what we have achieved is state capitalism. We got a whole nother sacrifice for God knows how many years to get to. They would have ridden him out of the town on a rail. He couldn't. So he did what politicians do. He substituted the wish for the reality. We've made it. We're here. Socialism is when the government does stuff. And it's more socialism, the more stuff it does. And if it does a real lot of stuff, it's communism. Everything becomes how much to go. So the French think it's socialist if the government regulates a lot and owns a few things like, I don't know, Air France or the government makes Gitan cigarettes, which it does. But if you, the government takes over everything, that's not socialism, that's communism. The measure becomes how much the government does. This is a joke on Marx. Marx never wrote an article about the state. He wasn't interested in the state. He was interested in the transformation to a new system. And one final thing that all we have time for today, and we'll do some more in June. One more thing. Every economic system has had both private and state forms of that system. I'll give you an example. In slave societies, all through the history of the world, it wasn't always that only private individuals had slavery. Sometimes states owned slaves. Though you'd have to speak of private slave economic system and state slavery. The Roman state owned slaves. I'll give you another example, feudalism. Many of the lords, say, of French, of French feudalism were private individuals, but the French king, the state, also had serfs. So you had private feudalism and state feudalism. The reason we both call them feudalism is because they were the same system. It's just the difference between a private individual and a state official. Capitalism's like that too. You can either be a private capitalist, an individual who owns and operates a business as an individual with no relationship to the state, then you're a private capitalist. Or the government can do that. The government can hire workers, buy raw materials and tools and equipment, manufacture something and sell it in the market. You know, like, I don't know, Amtrak, TVA. 2,500 uh, cities in the United States have a public power. I don't know if you're aware of that. 2,500 cities in the United States produce their own electricity as a public enterprise and sell it to their own people. Uh, Holyoke, Massachusetts, about three hours from here, is a perfect example. For, for the last century, they have a, a, an electric generating plant that produces electricity, which is then sold to the people of Holyoke. The profits from that are given by the Holyoke Electric Company to the city of Holyoke, which therefore taxes its citizens less since they don't need to tax them as much since they're getting the profit from producing electricity. 
That's state capital. The state is the capitalist. The state is the investor, the state is the employer, the state is the receiver of the profit, and the state is the determiner of what is done with the profit. The state is the capitalist. Does that mean we have socialism? Yes, if you are a senator from Alabama. <laughs> and I don't mean to be critical of Alabama, but although I do enjoy that, I, I, I don't mean to, to be. The state is one thing. Socialism as something fundamentally different from capitalism is something else. Okay, we've run out of time. I promise you we will continue part of the major discussion on um, in June when we meet, the second Wednesday of June, will be a particular focus on what it would mean for a transition from capitalism to socialism once you unhook the notion of socialism from this focus on the state. And that'll help us conclude by showing you how many of the concepts of socialism are locked into this fetishization of the state, this focus on the state, which misunderstands the history, versus how many of the definitions of socialism really have to do with the transformation of an economic system, which is what Marx and his contribution was much more focused on. I think this is very important because my guess is that Bernie Sanders, as a socialist running for president, uh, is the first of a much larger rediscovery by the United States of all of, a, of, all of that taboo. You know, we can now talk about sexuality in a way that until recently was unthinkable in this culture. That suggests to me that something similar is possible and indeed I think coming in terms of these political and economic issues that we have to grow up as a nation to finally outdo the kind of childish fear and taboo that governed this. Personal illustration, as I have told many of you, I went to the best universities this country has and I studied there and I went through their courses and I majored in economics, history, stuff like that. I, Harvard, Yale, and Stanford, the only schools I ever went to, okay? I was never required to read Karl Marx on anything. That's childish. That's pee pee on you. It's beneath any concept of reasonable, rational education. And this was at a time when more and more of the world was getting intrigued by Marxism. And as the world became more Marxist, Russia, China, Vietnam, Cuba, you name it, the, the blinders of American higher education became narrower and narrower so that we now have a generation of people, most of whom when they raise their hands when I give speeches and ask about socialism, what their questions amount to is not this or that detail. The basic question they ask me is, what is it? And at first, I was so distraught. My God, what is it? But then I realized, they're asking me. And that's very good. <laughs> because I'd rather me answering that question than the kind of answer they would have gotten from virtually anybody else. So I stopped being upset, and I now understand I've got to do, people, and I'm not the only one, people like me are doing all over the United States is reviving an awareness of something that shouldn't have been swept under the rug with taboo in the first place, but better late than never. Thank you all very much. I will see you in June.